Well, hello, everybody. My name is Noah Chartoff. I work academic outreach at Wolfram. And uh, I'm going to be talking today in a little bit about using Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition from the perspective of someone who is used to the Wolfram language, the coding language used in Mathematica. But first, I'm going to be turning this over to John, who oh, will well. Uh, tell you a little bit more about what he's going to do. Hi, I'm John McNally. I'm also a member of the Academic Outreach Team. And uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about uh, coming to Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition from either Wolfram Alpha or Mathematica for people who have a little bit of familiarity with that. Um, I also uh, have a, a sort of a bias as an educator because I worked as an educator before coming to Wolfram Research. And so um, there's some parts of what I talk about that are definitely going to uh, have that as uh, part of their, their uh, in, uh, bias toward it, which I think is good because it's a fantastic tool for educators and for students. So uh, what I'm first gonna do is just show you a couple places on Wolfram Alpha that hopefully you're familiar with. Um, if you haven't visited them, please do because they're great resources. So what I'll do is I will uh, bring this up. So the first thing that you should be able to see is the uh, landing page when you get to Wolfram Alpha. So here, of course, you have natural language input. You can also type in math input. Uh, you're probably familiar with these features already, but in case you weren't, this is how it works. And so uh, let's say that I want to um, you know, type in an integral, right? So I can click this and I get boxes I can fill where I can put in whatever input I want. I can also use natural language. And also if I switch back and forth between these, I can see some translation of how this works. But uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. So this is the landing page. Uh, there's also, if you look at examples, which you can get to just by navigating here, you can also see that there are examples by topic of what you might be interested in in a lot of different areas. So let's say that we're interested in money and finance. We can see all sorts of places where you can start. So one thing that's nice about Wolfram Alpha is that you can put in any natural language query that you want and see what you get. and if you're not sure what you want yet, or you want a little inspiration on where to look, these examples are a great place for browsing. Uh, the other thing that I just wanted to make sure that people are aware of is this problem generator, right? So this Wolfram Alpha problem generator, and there'll be some uh, links in the uh, notebook just in case anybody wants to see those later. Um, this problem generator uh, can also be browsed by common core standards, which is great. So. We can browse here. We can also go to common core standards. Let's say I want some high school standard. Well, let's actually say maybe I want a grade six standard. So let's see what we get. So I can look up arithmetic. I can uh, have problems generated. Let's say I want to multiply and divide fractions, right? So I get problems that I can give a try. Uh, I don't know if I'm brave enough to enter this live. Let's see if I got it right. And I did, good. So. Um, these are just three Wolfram Alpha resources that hopefully you have some familiarity with. Um, that I won't be going into too much depth in, but I just wanted to highlight these for talking about coming to Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition if you know a little bit about and have used Wolfram Alpha. So let me stop sharing this and bring up the presentation notebook. Okay, so Shout out to all educators who are watching. Uh, if you happen to be an educator or you know an educator that might be interested in these technologies, uh, please do direct them to this stream, uh, also to Wolfram Alpha in general, um, because there's a lot of resources that are fantastic that I'll be talking about here in a minute. So shout out to educators. Uh, if you know any educators, if you are an educator, feel free to put that in chat, uh, direct them here. Okay, so let's get started. So this is just some links to uh, the places that you've hopefully already visited and that I highlighted at the beginning. So uh, quick aside, this was the first question I ever asked Wolfram Alpha uh, back when I was taking a class where this integral came up and I could not for the life of me remember where the factors of two go, right? So I searched, stumbled across Wolfram Alpha and sure enough, you type this in and you get exactly what I was looking for. Um, so this is the same query in Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition, but just as a historical point of fact, um, this does all kinds of cool stuff. So let's continue on. So 
all the natural language tools that you love from Wolfram Alpha, you will be able to use in Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition. So let's say that you're a fan of the calculation tool, the mechanical work calculator. And again, you can find lots and lots of examples of these on the uh, examples page, or you can just get them by typing in natural language inputs and seeing what happens, right? So this is also something that you can do in Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition. Uh, you get this nice calculator where you're able to compute whatever you want. And when you first type it in, you even get to see what formula it's using, which is great as an educational tool. You can also, if you want to, if you click this button here, so underneath any natural language input cell in Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition, you just click this right here, which I've already done, and you get this next line that queries Wolfram Alpha and shows you what that would look like on the Wolfram Alpha page. So as we'll get into in a little bit later, the results you get back for the full Wolfram Alpha are what you asked for, plus some other things that maybe you didn't ask for, but are related to your query. So for example, we get a nice schematic of, this is a representation in a diagram of what you would actually use this sort of calculator for, right? So this is a great visualization in a lot of examples. Let's say you, you hear of a uh, topic, uh, this is more for students rather than the educators, but let's say that you hear a topic that you are like, hmm, I'm not really sure what the uh, physical picture I should have in my head is in my, my engineering or science class or whatever. You put that in and you can get this. And this is accessible either through using this button right here in Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition or just using Wolfram Alpha. Um, there's of course calculation tools for mathematics as well. So for example, if I want a Riemann sum calculator, if I'm in my calculus class or teaching a calculus class, we can get this nice output here in Wolfram Alpha, Alpha Notebook Edition. Um, in addition to having a general calculator, which has all of the parameters I can adjust, and I'll get into explaining where those show up here just in a minute, you can also be a little bit more specific in your natural language query, right? So instead of doing a Riemann sum, and having a general calculator, I can do a more specific one. I can say, I wanna do a Riemann sum of this function between minus six and six. So we get this very nice formatted output that shows how this sum is obtained, what the exact result is, what integral this is related to, what you get when doing this integral, and then all just sorts of nice information, including a visualization. And again, that's all just from one natural language input. So either as an educator looking for resources, you're creating something that you wanna to show to your students. A one line, a very simple query gets you all this. Um, you can also adjust it. So let's say that you enter this natural language input, you notice that, wait a minute, there's uh, something here related to the interval and maybe this is something to do with how many uh, boxes I'm using to approximate this sum. Well, I can just be a little bit more specific in my query and sure enough, you'll see this updated here. And again, in a slide, I'm going to explain a little bit more about what this is doing below the natural language input. So don't worry about that if you haven't seen this before. I wanna emphasize before doing that, that this is not just for science and math, right? So I come from a science and math background and so that sort of biases a lot of the things I first used this for. However, there's a ton of examples that you can use from any subject. Uh, so for example, let's say I wanna know the castles in London. So I type in castles in London in natural language, I get a nice list. Let's say that I wanna know the three smallest countries by area. Now, this is a small difference between Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition and Wolfram Alpha that we'll get into in a little bit more here in a second. But this is an object that contains information about all those things. Oh, but I just want the list of that. So the, the three smallest countries by area are Vatican City, Monaco, and Gibraltar. And in Wolfram Alpha, um, if we click results there, we could see that that would just give us this plus a little bit more. We'll get into why that happens in a second. So I can also use this. There is some great community posts about food and nutrition content. So this comes from something that I also wanted to highlight here on the next slide. Uh, so how much iron is in one cup of fresh orange juice? Well, apparently there's this much. So again, not just for science and math, all kinds of great content in here that you can use for adding computation to any subject area not just computation, but critical thinking. We'll, uh, if we have time at the end to get into that is a little bit of a bonus content. Okay, so what are some differences? So one difference that there is are starting points. So we can browse from a long list of subject areas and notebooks that help provide inspiration. 
So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, end the presentation so that you can see this bar up here. So this is what I'm referring to when I'm talking about starting points, demonstrations, and interactive plot quizzes. So if I go to these starting points, what I'll wind up getting is a long list of subject areas, which is very similar to those examples that you saw through Notebook Alpha. However, for Wolfram Alpha, I think I misspoke there. But however, these are full notebooks, just like we're working in a notebook here with Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition. So if I go to these starting points, um, you'll get a lot of inspiration on what you want to use this tool for. Also, it can be helpful if there's a specific thing that you're pretty sure it can do, but you're not sure how to phrase your question. Starting points is a great place to find that. So I, I believe Noah is going to talk a little bit more about that uh, during that part of the presentation. But let me resume this and show off some plot quizzes. So the quizzes, which you can access during that top tab, or you can just ask a natural language uh, query. So what do we get? We get this wonderful quiz, which is saying, adjust the three points given on this curve to apply a translation of three to the right and one down. So what your students can do with this is they can try making these geometric transformations on what they're seeing. And I have, of course, done this incorrectly. This is not the transformation that the quiz was asking for. But let's check my answer. And oh, nope, that was not the right one. So I, I won't go through adjusting these to the exact right place. But you can see how this works. So this is another thing which is in Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition, uh, which is a fantastic tool for you for figuring out how you want to get started. And the other thing that you can do is you can go to demonstration. So again, in that top right corner, which maybe I'll, I'll show one more time. So uh, depending on what kind of, whether you're in presentation mode or regular, sometimes this slides around a little bit. So actually over here, it's on the left, but in uh, other notebooks that aren't presentation notebooks, it's usually slid over here, but either way, it'll be on the top. Um, you can have, again, demonstrations, which come from the Wolfram Demonstrations Repository, the starting point notebooks, or the plot quizzes. And they're accessible right up here. And if you're uh, accessing this presentation notebook at a later time, uh, I've got a link to one that I particularly like for being able to uh, roll dice and flip pennies in order to have your students do problems involving calculators, <laughs> uh, probability calculate probabilities and understand how those are distributed. Um, sometimes, uh, quick aside, uh, if you're doing a, a lesson that involves a, a large class, uh, suddenly you want to know, where can I find enough pennies that they can do this demonstration? If you have physical pennies, that's great. But if you don't, you can find tools like this on demonstrations. Um, OK, so quick aside over, let's continue. All right, so I've talked a little bit about how the inputs uh, are all natural language uh, that you can do, uh, and that works just fine. But the outputs are slightly different uh, comparing Wolfram Alpha to Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition. So, for example, if I ask Wolfram Alpha to plot Gabriel's horn, we'll see what that looks like below in a minute. Gabriel's horn is a mathematical surface, if you're not familiar with that one. Um, you're going to get a slightly different output, but I'll show the difference. So, if I say plot Gabriel's horn in Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition, I get this fully computable object as an output, just like you would with any Wolfram notebook, right? So I can move this around. I can see inside the surface. I can look at it from different angles. And this is very easy to do in Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition. This is a great way for your students to explore geometry. And I also get to see not only just the output, but I get to see what Wolfram language also produces this output. So if I wanted to plot Gabriel's horn, not using natural language, but using Wolfram language, this is how I would do it. And that would produce this output that you see right here. OK, so if I then click Wolfram Alpha results to compare, we don't need to choose, right? Because I can just click this button. So here's the same thing. I typed in Gabriel's horn, and then I clicked this. And this is what it looks like when you click that button to get an input. And now this is what the Wolfram Alpha website would show, right? It shows me the plot that I asked for, but not only does it show that, it also shows some additional information. These parametric equations that describe the surface, it shows things like the area that uh, is the area element. If I'm looking at tiny little infinitesimal pieces of this surface, it also shows me the volume of the whole thing, right? So the inputs 
can be the same natural language input, but for the outputs, Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition shows you what Wolfram language code would produce a specific output. Wolfram Alpha by default shows you what you asked for, plus a lot of related things that you might not know you were interested in yet. So this is a great way in case you were gonna do a couple of queries uh, in a row that are related to the same thing, or you're just exploring, this can be kind of nice, right? So it's just, a, and you know, you don't have to choose. I wanna emphasize that. The complementary styles of output, right? So if you're looking for this specific thing, you get a specific thing. If you wanna know this sort of tableau of lots of related information, you can get that. So another difference between what you might be used to coming from Wolfram Alpha and using Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition is that you can use sequential computations in a notebook. So you can follow a train of thought computationally, just like with any Wolfram Notebook that you uh, might be used to. So as we all know from our own courses, or if you've uh, taught, a formula sheet is not particularly helpful uh, unless students already sort of know where to look, right? Whereas if you have a natural language tool, where a student has to have a problem presented to them and then think about, okay, what exactly do I need to solve this problem? Then query the natural language tool. I want the volume of a sphere of radius R. Well, okay, sure enough, there it is, right? We don't have to sort of browse around this obtuse formula sheet. We can just get what we want. You can then, using the possibility of having these sequential computations that build on each other, a la any notebook, you can define a function. I want to set the volume of some thing of radius r equal to that. So that's referring to the previous line. It can use one output sequentially in the next. And sure enough, this is a Wolfram language function that uh, Noah will talk a little bit more about uh, people who are coming from uh, using Wolfram language syntax are gonna be a little bit more used to this maybe than natural language. But you can see, it gets exactly what you would expect. So then, common thing that students are asked to do is, you know, given, say, this volume formula, um, find the radius in terms of that volume. You say, solve it for, for the radius. Um, well, you get three solutions in general, right? Because your students, uh, hopefully, when they're encountering this, it's an opportunity for them to learn or be reminded that, in general, a cubic polynomial is going to have three solutions. So if you want a specific one over only the real numbers, oh, sure, I can just then solve for r over the reals, and this natural language will frame that in terms of a Wolfram language line, then we get just the one solution over the reals rather than the, the three in general that could be complex, right? Um, so I'm, I'm showing some examples here that I think are important for teaching uh, students at sort of earlier grades. But this is to sort of show that, you know, just like anything using Wolfram language, it understands the mathematics. And so you're going to get things which are the correct answer. Um, so it's like any Wolfram language workflow, there's more than one way to express an idea. So this is uh, something I won't spend a lot of time in here in the live stream, but if you're looking at this notebook later, just a couple other uh, natural language inputs phrased in a slightly different way that lead us to the same place. Now, I can also use these previously defined things in future work. So, all right, my student has already looked at the volume of a sphere. Let's say I want to know the area of a sphere of that same radius. So instead of having to look on a formula sheet, right, my student has had to actively think about what do I specifically need? I need this. There it is. Then I can say divide that by volume R, which is this thing I defined previously. And Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition, unlike using just a website interface, will go back find the thing you defined, do the computation, return what you get. And then I can say plot that with R going between zero and five. And I get this nice plot that shows that the ratio of area to volume of a sphere in three dimensions uh, decreases as the radius increases. And so that has all kinds of interesting uh, uh, consequences for uh, the sciences. And that's something that you can talk about. As I said, I have a slight bent toward educational purposes because uh, it is my background. But uh, so another one is using manipulate to explore the structure of things. It's a very important uh, learning goal to be able to look at the geometry of a particular set of equations. So I can start off with a simple line. So I plot the general form of a line, ax plus b. Notice that this is not the same as Wolfram language uh, syntax exactly, right? But I get this nice thing. And... Um, 
we also have a uh, line that comes out from this manipulate. So if we have this structure right here, we get some nice ability to view this. And uh, I also want to emphasize that there's also examples where you can learn this for classes outside of mathematics. Again, uh, I come from a background where I, I did a lot of teaching of that. So these are some examples that leapt to mind at first. But uh, we, so we can look at things like earth science. We can look at uh, you know, plotting things to do with geography and stuff like that as well. But I just wanted to show that these are a couple examples that I find really useful for looking at the structure of things um, that your students can sort of see with very easy inputs and outputs, and then get a nice object that can be manipulated for having all sorts of interesting things. And please do call questions that you have in chat, and uh, we'll be able to get to those here at the end. Um, so in sum, uh, that was the, the main thing I wanted to talk about first, uh, before handing it off back to Noah, who can talk about um, how is someone who's more used to something like Mathematica coming to Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition. Whereas the first part of this was talking about if you're coming from Wolfram Alpha, what's it going to be like coming to Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition? And then if we have time at the end, I'd like to also include this bonus topic of, uh, you know, driving critical thinking in lessons that you're giving using Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition. But first, I want to have uh, a, a quick break for the uh, audience to be able to put some questions in chat. And then whenever Noah is ready, we can go to the uh, topic of what if you're more familiar with Wolfram language syntax? What's your experience then coming into Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition? Okay. Just wanted to add, saw a question about incorporating the software into the classroom as a tool for investigation, as a tool that lets you build answers up as you go. That is something that we are planning on talking about after the next section. Good question on that. So see there's more coming in for now. I'm going to move on. But if you have a question, absolutely say it whenever you have it. If we don't get to it immediately, we are planning on getting to as many as we possibly can. Also wanted to mention, some of the details in these documents we're showing might be going by a little bit too quickly to read all of them. We are going to be posting a <clears throat> downloadable friendly version where we might even add more text because we know we're not talking uh, over it at the time in a future version of this presentation when it's ready for watching not just live, but on the internet more permanently. So just wanted to let you know. OK. So I'm going to be talking about Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition from the perspective of a Wolfram language veteran. The biggest difference between Wolfram language uh, tools like Mathematica and Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition is the default use of what's called natural language input. In, for example, Mathematica, if you just click where there's currently no cell existing, getting this nice horizontal line, and just start typing, you'll get what's called an input cell. It, Everything written into it will be code. It will read it that way. But here, if you just start typing, it will create a natural language cell. Like here, I'll type the fifth power. And natural language cells take a combination of symbols, mathematical code, and just English descriptions of what you want to do and translate those into Wolfram language code, which it then runs. The translation happens remotely. It queries Wolfram Alpha, the website, but the actual running of the code, the heavy lifting, all happens here locally. So it speeds things up compared to running everything in the cloud. 
Now, here's some examples. These three orange natural language cells, they all define functions, right? For a intelligent human being who understands mathematics, all of these would be ways to define a function. But notice there is no syntactic consistency between the way that I've written these. I'm using the words let, set, define. I'm using the word equal, the symbol for equal. This sign has a <clears throat> excuse me, capital, this cosine lowercase, brackets, parentheses, it's all over the place. And pretty much any program I've ever run into in any other environment that you tried to use this many different ways of doing the same thing, it would just explode. But in this case, Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition acts like a person and says, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I understand you're defining functions, sure. So I will translate all of these into the syntax that we use to define functions. There are a lot of rules for that. There are underscores next to the variables so that it tells you it's a generic variable that can be replaced with anything. There's a colon next to the equal sign telling you that this is a definition and not just checking the equality of things. There are a lot of rules. But a novice user won't need to learn all of them before they can do anything. They can just describe what they want to do, and it'll get done. And then, as John said, unlike Wolfram Alpha, which is all one and done, you enter a question in Wolfram Alpha, it gives you an answer, but then if you answer something new, it obliterates what you had before. But in this case, Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition remembers what you said. Here I defined a fourth function based on those three functions, f, g, and h, that I defined before. And then having defined these things, I can plot them, I can investigate them, I can see what they do. You can also clear your definitions whenever you want, just in case there's concern about it causing any sort of problems later. <clears throat> and it's worth noting that whenever possible, you'll get the Wolfram language code, the Mathematica code, as part of your answer when it's selecting something. So although you could use this program to sidestep the need to learn coding, you could also use it to scaffold co the learning of co coding, making sure that people can investigate what is the correct way to write that code. And you also can write a lot of Mathematica code, Wolfram language code, exactly as it normally works in one of these natural language cells. If you go down letter for letter, capital for capital, bracket for bracket here, you'll see that these two are exactly the same. Didn't need to translate anything. It was the correct code already. And it created this nice little ripply 3D thing to investigate. It, just just for fun, let's see if there's an easier way to do that with natural language. Personally, I like this code. I love the Wolfram language. It's incredibly intuitive. It's got very reasonable rules, but this is so nice. Sine of A times X squared plus Y squared varying A. Compared to what we had to write before, it's a lot simpler, and it gives us the same sort of thing. Now, I say the same sort of thing because these are not exactly the same outputs. You can notice here, for example, the manipulatable variable a that I'm multiplying this by. It goes from 0 to 2. I didn't tell it what to go to, to or from. I could, but I didn't. And so it just guessed. Whereas before, I told it I wanted it to go from 1 to 5. That's why this version from before when I crank A up as high as it went is a lot more ripply than this one is. Now we'll return to that in a little while talking about what we can do about it. But for now, the important thing to see is that a whole lot of Mathematica code, a whole lot of Wolfram language code works perfectly. And, <clears throat> excuse me, that 
you can also use it to simplify your inputs considerably. Now it's worth noting that these are different programs, Mathematica and Wolfram Alpha. In addition to the default use of natural language cells like this, Mathematica is a little bit more customizable than Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition. Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition, excuse me, doesn't have what's called a slideshow palette. Um, you can do slideshows, but it doesn't have a palette for it specifically. And it doesn't have style sheets. Mathematica, you can make every single notebook look like a mathematical journal or like a textbook, different fonts, different uh, colors. And although there's a little bit to control there, there are no built-in style sheets for Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition. It by default looks the way that it usually looks. But the other big thing, there is some code that works in standard inputs that doesn't work well in natural language. At least at first, we're going to talk about what sort of codes those are and how to fix the problems. Here's an example of some code. It's OK if you don't understand every line of it. The important thing to understand, as I'll be showcasing right now, is that this is code that works in Mathematica. Here I'm showing the Wolfram desktop setup. Here's the exact code we put in before I run it. It creates a graph. The graph has a label. That all that jazz, very nice. Well, let's return to Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition and give that code a look. When I run that code, it says no Wolfram language translation found. And that's a little surprising. We don't need to translate this. This code is already perfectly fine. Well, there's a couple of things going on that's making some problems here. First of all, this code has multiple different lines, spaces, between the various things we want to do. Now, by default, Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition reads spaces like that as a blank, and it reads a blank as multiplication. I can showcase that here. Here's 2 plus 3, 4 plus 6. When I run this code, it understands the space between them as multiplication right there. So it's doing 2 plus 12 plus 6, and 20 is the result. If we look back in a Mathematica-like environment, and this is the last time I'll be switching back and forth between them, by the way, you can see running two separate lines of code in here. It just outputs two separate lines of solutions, 5 and 10, instead of multiplying things together. So that is a little bit different. You can see the use of the blank here as well. Here I put 17 blank 40, and it understood that as multiplication as well. And when you're putting in more complicated examples, you may not realize it's happening, but it can be. See here, the three blank three is read as multiplication as well. Now we can solve that solution pretty simply by just putting each line in an individual natural language cell. It'll run them five and 10 uh, independently. And as you saw before, you can run things in a lot of different lines that then interact in a line later, like when we defined functions and then had another function defined based on them. So that part's simple. Unfortunately, there is a larger issue here right now. Let's see what happens when we just take one line. It's a long line, but there's, there's no paragraph break in here. And when I just run this, it still says no wolf from translation found. But it gives us, that's a hint as to what's going wrong here. After all, it shouldn't have to translate anything. This is perfectly functional wolf from language code. The problem is that, like I said, this is querying wolf from alpha. And wolf from alpha is used by people from all sorts of different scientific dif disciplines. It's going to be used by mathematicians. It's also going to be used by physicists, chemists, people who are studying history, linguistics, uh, music theory, pretty much anything quantifiable. 
Wolfram Alpha has some materials on. And in different areas, some terms are defined different ways. For example, here we threw in G1 as something we wanted to use to define, to do what we wanted. But when I just put in G1 to Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition, I get something strange, this thing about Hertz. And to investigate that further, I can click on full Wolfram Alpha results and doing that, I see this. G1 is understood by default by Wolfram Alpha as a musical note, the first G on a piano, three scales below middle C. G2, by the way, is the G note, which is one scale above that, this one. Now, we could try to use G as something else, like a unit or a gene. But that won't solve our problem immediately because we need to be defining it as something completely different, uh, all that code. And it's worth noting that this sort of thing is improving all the time. I actually had to alter this notebook before the presentation because my previous example of a code that didn't work in natural language does work now. That's why I had to find this new example that doesn't. But there are ways to fix this. One thing we could do is pick characters that don't have as quantifiable a definition, like capital X. It means something in Wolfram Alpha. It means the letter X, and Y means the letter Y. But it doesn't have a quantitative meaning. It doesn't have a scientific meaning. And as such, when I try and run these definitions with using X, you can see it works in just fine. Didn't say no translation found, it ran it. And then having run it, I can sh run the instruction to show using exactly the same code as before, just split up into three separate lines. And it works just like it did in our Mathematica environment before. So that's great. But it's unideal, isn't it? I mean, here at Wolfram, we're very proud of our backwards compatibility. Any code that worked in Mathematica at some point will work in newer versions of Mathematica than the one it was created with, unless that code relies on some third party thing, like, um, like Flash, which is pretty much defunct at this point, if it was querying some website that doesn't exist, something like that. But the backwards compatibility is fantastic and can be used for things like the Wolfram Demonstrations Project that John was talking about and that we have a great link to up here in Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition. You can click on it and see materials that were written. Can, can people see the second window that just opened or does it look the same? I, I'm gonna, I'm going to, Can people hear me? Let's see. Let me just share the whole screen here so everyone can see it. Here's the Wolfram Demonstrations Project where you can see materials that were not written internally at Wolfram, but instead by the community. And so using a whole lot of Wolfram language code. And these can be extremely useful. Of course, you're going to want to be able to download them, edit the code, run the code exactly as it's written. So with all of that in place, we want a solution here that lets us run code exactly as it was previously written. Worth noting, by the way, that things like Stack Exchange, uh, non-Wolfram resources, they print useful Wolfram language code all the time too. Now, the good news, is you can absolutely run Wolfram language code in Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition by using a standard input cell. Now, there's a couple of ways we can do that. Remember how I mentioned that the Wolfram language code gets created? 
whenever you run one of these cells. Let's go back to our 3D example from before to take a look at that. Well, this isn't just for teaching what a code can hypothetically do. This code is live and editable. Remember before I mentioned that A goes from one to five in this example, which makes this potentially more ripply than the other version? Well, let's make that happen here too. Instead of going from zero to two, I can go from one, two, five, and then hit shift and enter, not just enter, shift and enter. And running that code, it has now changed it to the same sort of range as the one in the example above, equally ripply. So you see this input cell, the same sort of cell you'd get by default in Mathematica, can run standard Wolfram language code. So if I then was to go back to our solution section and type in, oh, it doesn't really matter, anything, two plus three. Running that, I get the code below it. I could edit that code to be something else if I wanted. Like, um, let's nab the code from before in exactly its original format. Just copy all of this and throw it into that two plus three example. Note this, I got G1 and G2 running here. And when I run that, yeah, it runs just fine. Didn't need to change these to X and Y, nothing like that, everything is great. I like that solution. You can also, by the way, copy after you've created a an input cell here, you can copy it and paste it and then edit it later. Sign of pi, for example. And you'll have your own input cell as well. You don't have it doesn't have to be attached to the natural language cell you made. So that's nice. But you did then create that natural language two plus three or two to the tenth thing that you don't actually want in your notebook. So for me, my favorite way to create an input cell here is to click between cells where there's no cell right now. You'll get this nice horizontal cursor and a big horizontal line with a little plus. Click on the plus. And you'll see these are types of cells you can add, and there are more options. Going to select here. Now, my default option was input, so I could have just clicked OK. But in case you don't get that as a default, notice that input isn't actually in the drag down list here. The assumption made for Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition users is that it's mostly going to be used by people who don't know a lot of code yet. It's a great tool for students who are just starting out and that sort of thing. So it's not a default option, but you could just type it in. Just type in the word input and it will say, oh yeah, I, I know what that is. I know from input. And then the, excuse me just a second, that's from my previous thing, then the code that you got from before, I'll just copy it into this new input cell, which has nothing above or below it superfluous, and it works perfectly fine. It's also worth noting that now that Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition knows what G1 and G2 are meant to be in this notebook, that it's not a musical note, it has the definitions we gave it before, you can now use them in natural language cells. They won't get confused about that. They'll listen to you and remember what you said. So see, here I say show G1 and G2, and it translates that. No worries about any musical notes. It works perfectly well. It's also worth noting that you can open documents made in Mathematica with Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition, and the input cells that already exist in them will run perfectly fine. And like I said, 
these things are being improved all the time. Here's an example of something that didn't used to work. Parallelization. In Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition, it used to be that you couldn't run more than one process at the same time and only had one front end kernel. In this example, I show, um, created this to showcase that even though parallelization at the time didn't work, it still would do what you wanted to do just in sequence. Like this command says, please factor all of these numbers at the same time. And at, before, I got a lot of errors about that, but it did factor all of them. 12 is 2 times 2 times 3. 122 is 2 times 1 times 61 times all, all this. It, it factored everything. It just didn't do it all at the same time, but rather one at a time. But that was a little while ago that I created this example. Now, when I run it, <clears throat> I don't get any of those errors. It just does this whole thing normally. So some examples that run into difficulties today might be perfectly great tomorrow. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's also worth noting that there are things Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition can do that isn't an option in Mathematica. John mentioned one of my favorites, the starting points. When I click on this thing, and I can then share examples written by Wolfram, made for Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition of any number of things. Let, let's do sums right here. That shows natural language cells with some neat examples of prompts you can use that have neat outputs. And, and all of this is editable and runnable. I could edit anything I want, hit enter, and then I get all of this. Of course, I haven't defined B in this particular example, so you'll want to run these codes in sequence. You can tell B is not defined because it's blue in this example, but now that I run it, there it is. That works out just fine. And now, having done that, it gives me a simple numerical answer. And you can copy the text in one of these cells or the cell and its output or a whole sequence of cells and then paste it into another notebook and run with it. You can <clears throat> use these things to create your own worksheets, demonstrations, anything you might want. So I... There's also some features that I like that I'm still discovering, little things. Like, for example, in Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition, if I was to click on a space that there is no cell and hit the space bar, nothing else, I create a text cell. I don't have to set cell with. 1L? Ah, who cares? Um, I will not have to change the format of it because by default it says, oh, okay, spacebar, I bet that you're typing words instead of math. And I just love that. And that's not even in Mathematica. It's a, a feature that I just really enjoy. So bottom line, Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition, it's fantastic for new users. It can cut down on the time needed to learn precise coding for Veterans, sometimes something that's set up for a no newer user can cause a small stumble. But if you look into it a little bit, these problems should be fixable. And it's just an amazing tool for veterans and novices alike. OK, so looks like. We've got a few questions. One of them is, is it, is it possible to run the notebook version offline? Yes and no. Now, obviously, 
we're talking to you on the internet right now, so I can't turn off my internet and show you how this works. But I can say that the translation from natural language to Wolfram language code does require the internet. Absolutely, it does. Um, something like, excuse me, uh, something like this that then translated the code. That requires the internet. But then something like this, where I take completed Wolfram language code and run it without any of those orange boxes, that can be run offline. I do not need the internet to make that work. So if you want to create a notebook which just has normal input cells, you could absolutely run that in an environment where you did not expect to have the internet. Let's see, uh, John, you seeing anything that you particularly have something ready to talk about? Okay. Yeah, so I really enjoyed the question about, um, you know, ways of using this as a way to uh, jumpstart critical thinking for your students in classrooms. There's, also, there's been a lot of other really good questions along the way too. Um, I'm eager to jump on that one because I have a little bit of material prepared for that. Um, but please put all other questions also in the chat um, and we'll try to get to those as well. But I want to come back to that one that was uh, kind of earlier on in the stream um, and uh, share some things related to how, how can I use this as an educator. So let me pull up the notebook again. And there was another question, will these be available um, that you can download? Uh, Yes, not right this second, but uh, there will be a place that will put these notebooks uh, probably combined into one uh, notebook so that you can uh, get, get your uh, access to all of this. Okay, so how can I uh, drive critical thinking in the classroom? So one, one thing that I want to return to was um, using manipulate. So if, if you happen to be in a math context, um, doing things and then say that you want to vary parameters. So looking at the general case, because a lot of times I feel that in many uh, curriculum, the general cases are underdeveloped in terms of what we're teaching our students, right? But that's not a problem if you're using a tool like this, right? You can just look at the general case and uh, be able to get a very visual, very interactive sense for how this works, right? So if we're trying to have students understand what are these parameters doing in a quadratic equation, right? How, how does these numbers here, how do these numbers here affect um, what I'm seeing? Well, if I vary this one, it seems that this, and again, I like how it also shows over here that we've got, um, you know, this manipulate, I didn't tell it that it had to, to show me the axes give me all these controls. I can just enter that in natural language and it labels everything and does all this for us, right? So that's great. Um, but anyway, this leading one that's a coefficient of x squared, right? I can have my students see that this has something to do with curvature. So that's interesting. Um, the one at the end has something to do with how far up and down it goes. And the one in the middle has a slightly more complicated role, but has something to do with like left and right, has something to do with maybe where it crosses the other axis. So that's just one example that we already touched on, but I wanted to get into some other ones. So one thing that is really important if you're looking at either um, inquiry-based or modeling instruction or all, all kinds of different paradigms of teaching. Uh, again, I have a physics teaching uh, bias, so I'm gonna do this one first and then we'll do a different example. Um, so it's really important to not just teach computation details, right? It, it really should be a learning goal that we want to uh, have our students focus on what's the strategic problem solving that I'm actually doing. What's the real critical thinking? So if you've ever taken a physics class, you, you've seen many, many, many examples of just a wall of text, right? Of there's some situation and there's probably gonna be some math involved and I'm expected to come up with something, right? Um, so what I learned is it's best to teach your students, what's, what's the TLDR, the too long didn't read, of this wall of text. So what this is telling me is, oh, I need to like use Newton's second law. I need to have some idea of what that is about. I need to convert between coordinate systems, do some vector arithmetic, 
and then convert back to the old coordinate system. What we should be teaching our students, in my opinion, is how do I parse some complicated situation into the strategic goals? And then we can focus on those strategic goals using natural language, right? Or some combination of natural language and numbers, if it happens to be a physics example, but that, that will vary as, as the, the topic varies. So how do I do this first strategic goal? Well, my student has to know what Newton's second law is. There are actually ways of querying to find out more about that, but let's assume that we're, we've already taught our students that. Um, so I can combine these two given quantities and get the results in the quantity that I'm looking for. Uh, another pathway, so just in case the students forget that this unit of a Newton for force is not a fundamental unit, but the derived unit. So if my student doesn't add this in Newton's part, you might get something which isn't exactly what they were expecting. And then you have to engage their critical thinking faculties to say, oh, wait, that's because Newtons aren't a fundamental unit. Um, these are the units that came up. And I want to give that in Newton. So again, this ability to refer to what was just done. Oh, wait, I forgot one detail. Let me do that in Newton. And, you know, that, uh, is, is, uh, th that computation is done, right? So, and, you know, this isn't just saying, oh, give me a quick answer, right? Because the student has to recognize, oh, wait, these are the units not yet combined. Let me give that in Newton. So the student is actively thinking about what happens between this step and this step, and then just using natural language to quickly do it without the tedious part of doing the calculation. Um, the uh, second strategic goal that we had was finding the components of some vector, right? So okay, well, I have this vector and I wanna know what is that going from polar form to some other form. Now the student has to know what polar form is to type in this thing, but right, this is engaging what you're actually teaching about in the class. You can teach about the concepts of polar form and things like this, as well as the calculation details, because if I do this exact input, sure enough, we get the exact result. If I want to have it rounded, I can, of course, do that in much the same way I would um, using standard Wolfram language. If I put in a decimal point here, it's a signal that, oh, I'm not looking for an exact answer anymore. I'm looking for an approximate answer. But I see from this, oh, the student can say, wait a minute, there's several things I can learn here just by doing this inquiry, right? I learn what's the structure. I can spot the pattern here of the answer. I can also see, oh, there's like a Wolfram language function that is doing this for me. And then if you click these little buttons over here, uh, this will take you to the documentation of the function that gets called, where you can read about that using um, the, the great documentation pages that are available. So this, uh, as Noah mentioned, is a way that you don't need to know any Wolfram language syntax in order to do this input. But if one of your learning goals is also to slowly introduce your students into the syntax of programming, then you can also definitely do that using the same tool. Um, so now your student has to actively decide which results are going to be important for later, right? It's not just the same as being able to, uh, you know, get this result. They have to decide, I'm probably going to use that for something. Let me make a variable and set something equal to that. And Noah has something that he'd like to jump in real quick here. So let me um, pause for just a minute before going. I wanted to uh, quickly address a couple of interesting questions that seem pertinent to what we're discussing here. Uh, one person asked, is there publications that compares the different Wolfram products, the features that they have? The, the answer is kind of. that There are sometimes screens like uh, this one that point out that Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition combines the simplicity and flexibility of Wolfram Alpha with the power and workflow of Mathematica, says something like that. Sometimes the products are directly compared, but mostly each product is really described in its own particular terms. And that's part of the reason that we're doing exactly this live stream. We wanted to clarify what it's like to come from one of these products to another. We also had a similar question coming in, which is of Wolfram Alpha, Mathematica, and Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition, which is more beneficial for the classroom environment. That's a great question. It's a lot like asking whether a whiteboard or a smartboard is going to be more 
beneficial for your classroom environment? In some classrooms, there's a very clear answer to that sort of thing. Maybe you're in a computer science classroom and you want to be by default teaching people about the intricacies of the syntax of code and the, um, that sort of thing. And in that case, probably you're going to want to default to Mathematica. Maybe you're in a class that uses a lot of computational thinking, but wants to stress no code, casual language sort of things. Maybe it's a mathematical class for non-math majors, like a class on psychological statistics, something like that. In that sort of situation, almost definitely you're going to be want to be looking at Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition or possibly even Wolfram Alpha. The each class is going to have its own particular priorities. Here's one thing that I can say pretty definitively. Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition is, a f is probably the best of all of these things at allowing you to, do, to show your work at the next level because everything you'll be doing in whatever the assignment is from analyzing data to describing your process, is can be done in a single notebook. That's true in Mathematica too, but in Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition, you have more flexibility with how you're going to be doing that. Um, I'll I'll show you a little example of that that I also personally like. I mentioned before that you don't just have to use numbers, code, or English words. You can also use symbols, mathematical symbols in natural language processing. Like right here, I'll write up the definite integral from three to five of sine of x. Now, those of you who know Mathematica well will know that I wrote this in a way that Mathematica wouldn't like. I used a lowercase s for sine. All predefined functions in Mathematica use capital letters. I also used parentheses instead of brackets. That would cause me a problem. But I'm in a natural language cell right now. So if I hit enter, it will not only say, oh, that's a nice latex style thing that you can then print in another document. It will run this as code and interpret it as best it can. And in this case, it changed it to a capital X to brackets and gave me the answer. For um. I, I have my favorites of these. I started on Mathematica, so it's probably the one that I like the most for myself. But depending on the class that I was teaching, I would be changing it up. Even the size of the class can matter because different arrangements of products are usable in different ways. Like for example, Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition by default has a cloud version. You could use this on a Chromebook that doesn't have a lot of space to download a large piece of software. Whereas Mathematica by default, it doesn't, but you can add it on. So depending on the particular needs of your classroom, you're going to want to suit it to the audience, including yourself. Okay, I, it looks like we're pretty much out of time, but we'll we'll get in a little bit extra now. And uh, John, I see you have something else you want to add. Yeah, I, I also wanted to chime in on that question of um, so I, I can tell you about my experience before um, Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition uh, was something that was on my my radar, right? So one one thing that I used to do was I would use Wolfram Alpha to get students used to the idea of handing off a particularly well-framed question to a computational tool that could quickly and easily get back a result that then they can continue to use in their work. And I would, I would frame that, identifying that step in the problem solving process as something to recognize of, oh wait, this is a thing that can just more easily be done by a computer than me, right? And I, would, I used to use Wolfram Alpha for that. Um, and then later on in that same class, I would try to use uh, various ways to sort of gently introduce more syntax to also have the skill of coding. And so before I knew that Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition was a tool that could do both of these things, that's the way that I used to structure it. Now that um, Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition sort of exists and, and has natural language plus the ability to run Mathematica um, things that you've written there, anything in the Wolfram language, that you can uh, write in Wolfram language code uh, will run an input cell in, uh, um, in in the way that you intended. 
So now that there's a platform for both, if that's what you were intending to do, maybe that's the tool that you want. So it's it's a good question. Um, I think that you know what what you what tool you want to use depends exactly on what your learning goals are. Is the the main the main thing that I I really wanted to do. Um, I want to real quickly one more thing um, before jumping into um, our sign off here. So uh, I'm not going to. Uh, you know, belabor the point about having uh, these uh, various strategic goals, right? When we make this notebook available, um, you know, you, you can get into more detail on that. But there's another example that I think is great from uh, in this context of, of earth science, but you can use real data to teach analytical skills. And I think this blend of having the ability to use natural language and, um, you know, Wolfram language inputs is really beneficial here. So I'll just talk about a little bit of this before checking to see uh, how we're doing on time. So, for example, if my students are starting some inquiry-driven instructional sequence about plate tectonics, right? Maybe they don't know it's about plate tectonics yet, but as, as the instructor, I know that that's where this is leading. I just give them some project about, you know, find out about earthquakes. So they say, oh, all right, well, what are, what are the earthquakes in the U.S.? And maybe they don't get exactly what they were expecting, but you can very easily read this Wolfram language code and see exactly why this was the result. So if I run uh, function that says earthquake data at this place. Maybe your students aren't quite sure what these numbers are about. They could maybe guess it's the magnitude of the earthquake. But again, if you use this button here to look at documentation, um, that's very clearly explained. Oh, but here's why nothing came up. There was no result because it was yesterday to today. And so if there doesn't happen to be anything, of course, that's what happened. So this is an, another opportunity to engage those critical thinking, real analytical skills, I needed a more specifically framed question to get the information I was looking for. I actually, I didn't want just earthquakes. And then the interpreter says, well, did you want yesterday to today? Ah, I wanted earthquakes from these dates. And then again, this is Wolfram language code that then you can use later. And so, um, you know, you can see that there's a lot of information available about these earthquakes. And so then, you know, perhaps what you want to do as an instructor is you want to add a one-liner. So what you can do is you can take to this precise line, you can put it here, maybe give it a variable assignment because you know you're going to need it later, and then say out of this data set, and this is something that I would probably help students with in the beginning, is I, I don't want all of this information actually, I just want the position. And so again, you can, if it's a, a group of students that you think are very um, uh, engaged and motivated to go find themselves, which hopefully all your students are, um, you know, they can read documentation, figure out that, oh, if I just want a specific piece of information, I put it here. Or you could, as an instructor, provide a one-liner that, um, you know, gives you exactly what you want. And quick reminder, not all red messages are bad messages. This is just saying that, oh, there were earthquakes that happened on the same day. And so I combined those for you when I gave you this series of events. So this is not a bad red message. It's just an FYI red message. And then I can uh, make a nice plot for the students to see, or they can do it themselves actually, right? So we can introduce the concept of, there's this thing like a built-in symbol that has a specific meaning in this, this language. And then we can sort of transition from natural language into using syntax more within the course of the same instructional sequence. And as an instructor, you can decide based off of exactly what your goals are, how quickly you want to do that? Do you want to do that within the same lesson? Do you want to do that over a series of lessons, over a series of years? If you're working in a, 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 a situation where you know that there's going to be the same group of students that you um, are seeing again and again, right? So, uh, you know, there, there's all sorts of variations on that theme, right? And you, as an instructor, I think there's no general um, best case advice. The, the, the advice there is that. Yes, you can transition from natural language to syntax if that's one of your learning goals. Um, and the specific way that you implement that is going to be very dependent on your context. Um, but maybe maybe we could, uh, if people are interested, put together a presentation just on how do I decide what my context is about that question at some point. Um, please, again, if you know any educators that you would like to, um, uh, you know, have be able to ask their questions, definitely please refer them to uh, this when it goes up on the uh, permanent page and on uh, the uh, notebooks uh, if they happen to already be uh, using notebooks. If they're using Wolfram Alpha, this might be a good way to 
or if they've even not heard of Wolfram Alpha, this might be a good way to bring that onto the radar as a really great tool that maybe they hadn't considered using in the classroom. So the, um, you know, the rest of what you can do in something like this uh, is here in the notebook, which we'll make available here. So I wanna check in with everybody to make sure that we're doing all right on time, but, uh, or if there's any other questions that we have here. But that concludes the sort of structured part of the, the presentation. So let me uh, stop sharing and we can maybe get to some questions and see what's going on there. And just, uh, I wanted to, to add, thank you guys all for uh, showing up. Thank you everyone for going by and thanks to our great technical team that made this live stream possible. Let's see, I'm not seeing, Oh, okay, here we go. I see a question here. What are some contrasts that you could utilize to explain the differences between Wolfram uh, Notebook and some graphical software like Desmos or GeoGebra? Great question. Okay, so in uh, the cases of GeoGebra and of um, Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition or Mathematica, you can create dynamic things where you change a variable on the fly and see how it in an animated way changes around. D Desmos, extremely good to, at doing that for two-dimensional graphs. GeoGebra, extremely good at doing that for geometric shapes. I, I'm, I'm definitely not going to say anything against the, those technologies in those respects. Now, one thing that has stuck out to me, though, is that let's say a student says, here's the graph I got in Desmos. They're probably sending you a screenshot of that if it's in an assignment. Maybe you're looking over their shoulder. Maybe you're working at the same time in a cloud environment. In those sorts of situations, that's not an issue. But if it's something they have to work on at home, homework, something like that, then the best you can do is see a picture. And at that point, what if the graph is wrong? What happened? I have no idea. Like the best I can do is guess. Did they accidentally write the wrong number somewhere? Did uh, another thing that they had defined elsewhere interfere with what they're doing? I'm not sure. I don't see their entire workflow right at a time as an instructor. Now, with Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition and Mathematica, these are rightly called notebooks. It's not just replacing, say, a calculator, which can graph things and do calculations. It's great at that too, but it also allows you to see written explanations that students wrote out, their answers, their work, the code they use to create the work. Every part of it is there. Like I said, it redefines show your work in that sort of respect. So I would say Desmos, Fantastic at one thing. GeoGebra, fantastic at one thing. And if that's what you're looking for, fantastic. At the same time, these uh, the notebook environment is more for something that's fantastic at a lot of different things. And that ensures that you can actually see the entire process that your students are doing. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, that would be the biggest sort of difference. And I'm saying, and I'm I'm seeing someone ask, can Wolfram Alpha Query, can you capture Wolfram Alpha Query data in a notebook? Um, you can in a, you, you absolutely can in that full Wolfram Alpha results is a button you can click after using natural language, which then will show pretty much, you know, there's some tiny differences, but the exactly what you will see in Wolfram Alpha when you asked about that. John showed that off when he was showing Gabriel's horn, that by clicking full Wolfram Alpha results, he would see the entire thing. It's possible in without a notebook environment to do that, like in a Word document, you could ca capture a screenshot or even put a link to the results, but I consider that a little unideal for a couple of reasons. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, looks like, John, you got something to add? Yeah, I, I do. Uh, so uh, 
I, the point about being able to debug workflow, I think, is great. Um, I, I found that to be so when I was uh, having students learn Wolfram language to do a, a project, um, you know, they had never seen it before. And being able to work in a notebook environment, whenever they would make a mistake, very easy to debug what was going on, right? I mean, so in, in an environment like that, um, is sort of, you know, showing you with, uh, uh, you know, delimiters, meaning like brackets and things like that being different color and things like that. So that you can, as someone who knows the syntax, you can sort of very easily parse maybe what went wrong if a student is trying their own input. Um, you know, having that, that notebook environment is fantastic. Um, another point that I would make about that is that um, uh, you, you can uh, not only show your work, but, you know, have it saved for later purposes, right? I mean, that's sort of a, an obvious point, but I think it is worth emphasizing that when you have a notebook that's a computable object, uh, anything that's been done exists then for future use. You can come back to it. So whereas if you're using something that um, is a website that doesn't necessarily save that kind of stuff, then, or you know, maybe it's harder to save or something like that, then uh, that would be one difference worth mentioning, I think. Um, something that has occurred to me about GeoGebra as an example, too, is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, or, or even, uh, yeah, as GeoGebra as an example, is let's say someone is creating a diagram of a whole lot of different, um, elements of, oh, I don't know, a triangle. Say this is a class on trigonometry. They write, they're writing equations into all of these things, maybe taking a screenshot of the thing they made in GeoGebra, writing equations into their screenshotting software, putting the images in a document to describe what they're doing, and then 17 steps in, they realize that step two was wrong. Oh, no, because not only are they now going to have to change things, they're going to have to redo all of that because they took screenshots, you know, it's static images. They're going to have to go back to the very beginning of everything they were doing and re-screenshot everything. Whereas if you're labeling things in Mathematica in a geometrical system, that document is live and editable all the way down. You realize you, that most of this is right, but one thing is wrong in every single one of these pictures. Edit that thing. Edit that thing. Everything else stays the same. You don't have to recreate everything that you made. You know, it's, it, it's a lot closer to the experience of a physical notebook, I would say, than uh, the integration of some other computer tools into lessons can be, at least for myself. I want to stress, though, that this isn't necessarily just to replace notebooks. I have seen Mathematica specifically used to replace uh, written assignments and have them, therefore, the instructions and the responses be in the same notebook. I've seen them used to replace lecture slideshows, where the entire thing is live and the teacher can interact with any of the code as they're going along, edit it if a student has a question about what happens when you do this. Let's find out. I've seen it used to replace textbooks. The entire text is now um, written explanations of things, graphics created in Mathematica, little um, prompts that say, hey, reader of this book, feel free to change this code in this, this, and this place. See what happens. What, um, what does that tell you about the process that you're uh, experimenting with. So any number of these things can be something that is used. When I was at the NCTM conference just the other week, a very common question that we got was, is this a tool for teachers to use or for students to use? And the answer is, it's it's a great tool that can be used by to, to any degree by anyone in a classroom. All depends on how you want to use it. Okay, John, anything to add or? Yeah, so um, uh, also uh, there was another question about uh, capturing relevant query data, manipulate and save definitions. Um, 
I think I know what that question is referring to, but maybe a quick clarification in the chat uh, if you'd like. But um, since it is a notebook, um, you know, if you're used to working with notebook and having things working across kernels and things like that, um, that, that should work as, as you uh, expect as far as I know. Um, so if that's what you're referring to with that. There, it is also an option on your own computer to input a new function's definition into something that then will persist through any Mathematica document. But it's that's too technical for me to know how to do off the top of my head and definitely too involved for us to do on the fly um, today. But it, it is it is absolutely possible. Worth noting, though, that that doesn't assure that this definition will persist into someone else's computer, depending on how they got the document from you. It's often good to have a couple lines at the beginning of your notebook that are what's called initialization cells. These are cells that run automatically every time the document is opened. And as such, they are a great way to take a definition that you're planning to use often and build them into a lesson, have them be already made up before the lesson begins. OK, I think we're coming up on the end of the uh, available time. Want to say again, thank you all for joining us so much. We look forward to being able to reach out to you some more. There are some other uh, video resources about Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition coming up too. We're going to have uh, the Wolfram U team is going to be putting out a video specifically for Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition for educators on November um, November 2nd, I believe. Yep. Yep. And so that'll be a thing. And we will be also working on some more videos ourselves. If there's anything in particular that you would like to see, feel free to reach out to Wolfram. They will get in touch with us. And uh, we're going to be including some contact information for ourselves in the documents that we will be sharing once a, uh, at a TBD time to be attached to a permanent version of this video. So again, thank you all for tuning in live or for watching this recorded afterwards and um, hope that you enjoy this tool as much as we do.